In this week's Whiskey Wire, we have some great new release announcements, including a new rye by the ex-owner of Whistlepig, Uber shutting down Drizzly, and a new whiskey destination in the works. All that and more. I'm Derek Stanford, and this is Whiskey Straight Up. Welcome to the show. I hope you all are really enjoying your week. I know I've had a pretty good week myself. I found a little extra time on my hands lately, so I've been trying to fill it up with things that are productive and not just sit on my ass like a fat ass. So um, this past week, I got to do a private tasting, which we'll talk about a little bit later. I reviewed Penelope Toasted, which uh, surprised me, actually. Um, And then I also did a video on some bottles that I regret buying last year. So like I said, it was a pretty productive week. Um, The private tasting was something that was pretty cool. Uh, Otherwise, I've been laying low at the house and just kind of working on projects around here. Um, You know, recalking some stuff in the kitchen, like things like that. So uh, not much to talk about in the personal life, but uh, still staying busy. So that's good. Um, All that aside, though, let's talk about this week's new releases. So the first one I wanted to talk about here is from Angel's Envy. They just announced their Cellar Collection series, volumes one through three. So this release showcases uh, 375 ml bottles from their cellar collection, uh, each featuring Kentucky straight bourbons by Angel's Envy that are finished in distinctive fortified wine casks. So this series includes an Angel's Envy Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey finished in Oloroso sherry casks. This, that one comes in at 100 proof. Uh, it has a Kentucky straight bourbon finished in Tawny Port wine barrels. That one comes in at 111.6 proof. And then the last one is a Kentucky straight bourbon finished in Madeira casks. That one also is 100 proof, uh, similar to the first one. So the Cellar Collection Series, volumes one, one through three, they're now available in limited quantities across the U.S. Uh, the price is $400. So, um, I mean, these retail for pretty high to begin with. So it's kind of cool that you get to get smaller bottles and maybe that instead of spending that crazy amount to buy all three, you can get them in smaller bottles now and it brings the cost down a little bit. 400 is technically still a lot of money, but you're getting three 375 bottles. I just feel like there's a little bit more value there considering how much you pay for the full size 750s. Um, so you can also go to Angels Envy's distillery uh, in Louisville on February 1st of this year, and you can purchase the release there. There's also going to be a lottery for people around the country for the opportunity to purchase the set. I know I got the email uh, late last week, so I know many of you probably did too. Uh, basically, if you win the lottery, you get a chance to buy this at retail at the distillery. And I think you have until like May to pick it up. So I think it's a cool little thing they're doing. I mean, that price point for the 750 ml is so high. I like the idea of offering, uh, getting three half bottles at a maybe lighter wallet hits. So, uh, I personally have not had any of these except for the first one. And I'm not typically an Oloroso Sherry cask finish fan. I do know that this one drank like a heavy hitter. It was almost like that that old Forrester effect where like the birthday bourbon where it's like 95 proof, but it, it just has so much flavor and it feels like it's maybe a, a buck 15, buck 20. Same thing here with this one. So I think if you like wine finishes and you like Angel's Envy and you've wanted to try these for a while... And maybe you have some holiday money burning a hole in your pocket or your tax return or something. Um, This could be a cool little buy for you. So the next one up is Patricia Green Cellars. They're one of the top producers from Oregon, uh, Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc. They're releasing their first two whiskeys. So what happened here is in 2020, they had wildfires in Oregon and it devastated a lot of this... uh, wineries you know vintage it left them with a lot of unsellable wine so uh along this whole process they ended up meeting with distiller lindsey sardell and uh it led to the idea to not only distill the tainted wine but to incorporate the resulting distillate in a distinctive whiskey that reflects oregon's abundant landscape 
The two whiskeys, Multifarious and Purple Karma Pinnacle, are actually available on site uh, at the, the winery right now. They won't be sold under the name Patricia Green Cellars. They'll actually be sold under Patty Green Whiskey Distillers. So a little bit about the whiskeys themselves. Multifarious is a blend of three strains of barley that was aged in both charred French oak and Oregon oak barrels. There's about 137 cases, and they're bottled at 98 proof. The Purple Karma Pinnacle is the name of the Tibetan heritage barley from which the whiskey is distilled. It's an incredibly small bottling at only 35 cases. They ended up doing this one at cast strength, which is 112 proof. Future releases are going to be uh, including strains such as uh, Franken Barley, Baroness Barley, Gazelle Rye, and Dark Northern Rye, which are all really interesting things that you don't see in normal whiskeys. So this might be something that anyone that likes like different whiskeys or different processes within the whiskey community you might want to check this out unfortunately for now you're going to have to go to uh the winery in newburgh oregon to get your bottles but i heard they're going to get some distribution in oregon at like bars and 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 some shops and then they're looking at maybe getting some distribution outside of there too so keep an eye out i uh, if you like interesting things this might be a good one for you so the third release we're going to talk about is a pretty exciting one. Bacta Spirits has officially released its Bacta 2013 Straight Rye Whiskey. This is Raj Bacta's return to rye. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Raj, he's responsible for Whistlepig. He started the brand and grew it before exiting. This particular whiskey, uh, you know, they're, they're leaning a lot on, on that, that he brought back rye whiskey. And I'll, you know, you got to give him some credit because he, he built up Whistlepig and he started it at a time where rye whiskey wasn't super popular. So you got to give them that. Um, but they're leaning heavily into it, which uh, you know, those other brands are responsible for that. And of course, you know, cocktails and bartenders around the nation helped as well. Um, so this particular whiskey is aged 10 years and eight months. And then it goes 75 more days in a Calvados cask finish. It's proofed at 107.6 proof. It's 95.5 malted barley. So 95 percent rye, five percent uh, malted barley. It retails at one hundred and forty nine dollars. Um, there's only eight hundred cases available for this release, and they gave some tasting notes on it actually. So the nose they say is vanilla, caramel, apple pie, and citrus. The palate silky, spicy attack of pepper and nutmeg. That kind of sounds a little uh, like without flavors, right? Um, I'm sure it's probably delicious. And then the finish is dry with a mellow oak. So anyone who's familiar with Whistlepig, if you like their whiskey, I would assume that you're probably going to like this because uh, the man behind the whiskey uh, is uh, responsible for this one. Now, it may be completely different. I haven't tried it yet. Uh, so keep that in mind. But, I mean, he's, he's a guy that's known in the whiskey community, and he's got a new release. Now, 150 bucks for a 10-year, 8-month rye. Uh, typically, I like to say $10 a year, but uh, it's a rye, and that, that changes because you don't get a lot of aged rye, which is why Whistlepig is so expensive. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I'm probably going to want to try this one, whether it comes in the form of a sample or I do have to pick up a bottle. It seems quite expensive, but it's intriguing enough that I think that if you have cash burning a hole in your pocket, I give it a shot and pick it up. And if you do, make sure to comment because I'd love to know before I go pick it up myself. All right, now it's time for some whiskey news. All right, so first up is something that's affecting the entire spirits community and not just whiskey. Uber is shutting down Drizzly, which it acquired about three years ago. In a statement, Uber said, after three years of Drizzly operating independently within the Uber family, we've decided to close this business and focus on our core Uber Eats strategy of helping consumers get almost anything from food to groceries to alcohol, all in a single app. Well, we're grateful to the Drizzly team for their many contributions to the growth of BevAlk Delivery as the original industry pioneer. So basically, it sounds like it, they're shutting it down, but it sounds like they're absorbing that into Uber Eats, right? Because we're shutting down Drizzly as a singular alcohol delivery platform, but 
you can order alcohol through our Uber Eats platform anyways. So I think they probably just used the Drizzly model uh, and probably the customers and everything else they acquired when they acquired the company and just implementing it into Uber Eats. That's what I'm guessing. Uh, Drizzly themselves on X said, we're shutting down slowly. Orders are still open until the end of March. We'll be sure to let you know when it's last call. So again, I think it just sounds like they're absorbing Drizzly into Uber Eats. For anyone that loves the Drizzly uh, platform and all that, they're, I guess they're shutting down the apps. So you're going to need to download Uber Eats if you want to continue that. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's much news at all, but I guess it kind of is because Drizzly is no more. And uh, you got to go to Uber Eats now. All right, next up, we have another company, another whiskey company that is unveiling plans for a build out. So we're looking at RD1 Spirits and they've unveiled plans for their $4.8 million brand destination. They're calling it RD1 Distillery at the Commons. This new location will serve as an anchor tenant of the Commons, Lexington's newest entertainment district uniting life, work, and play. With just over 10,000 square feet, this new brand destination will more than double the size of their existing tasting room and gift shop. The two-story building features outdoor seating areas on both levels overlooking a historic water tower that will feature RD1 artwork. The brand destination will include an interactive history meets innovation experience of Lexington's bourbon milestones, a fermentation to distillation tour, that sounds interesting, uh, four private tasting rooms, a glass enclosed R&D lab for wood finishing of Kentucky straight bourbon and barrel thieving. That's also really cool. So I guess you get to look in on them actually doing this and the fact that they're also doing it and having a shop for it. Like that's, that's pretty awesome. A VIP speakeasy tasting room, a craft cocktail bar, a gift shop and a space for private events. RD one is relatively new. They, uh, their Ambirana finish is fantastic. If you, haven't tried it yet go check out a review from a couple months ago uh it it's the best ambirana finish i think i've had you know it's not too overpowering it's really tasty and i haven't had much of their other other whiskey expressions i had their rye and it, that was that was very good as well now i know a lot of this is sourced and they're, they're they're saying that they're just distilling so i'm sure there's more coming from them but just, you know, another place in, not in Louisville or Bardstown. I mean, that's pretty cool. Like another, just another destination. They're new on the bourbon trail. I know that. Uh, so, uh, it gives them another place, uh, for these people that are doing the bourbon trail to go to. It just sounds like it'll, it'll be pretty cool. I guess we'll have to wait a little while and see how it turns out. I do know when they open up, I definitely want to go up and check it out. And, and let's be honest, I, I don't really need another excuse to head up to Kentucky. So, uh, <laughs> it's what it is. So anyways, my next segment is called the more, you know, did you know exactly what bourbon is May 4th, 1964. That is the date when the U S Congress recognized bourbon as a distinctive product of the United States. Here's a definition of bourbon per the code of federal regulation. It must be produced in the U S it has to be made from at least 51% corn. It's got to be distilled at 160 proof or below. They have to put it in a new charred oak barrel. Now, there's no age requirement for bourbon. It just needs to be in that barrel. It just needs to touch the oak. Then uh, it must be put into a container at 125 proof or below, and it can't contain any other added substances except water. That is bourbon in a nutshell. The more you know. Now, it's time for my bottle of the week. So my bottle of the week this week, I don't have with me. And there's a very good reason for that. It's Daniel Weller. So earlier this week, I received a text message asking me if I wanted to come to a private event. They can't talk about it. And I couldn't talk about it. Um, and they gave me details later. I said, okay, cool. Yeah, let me know. Uh, it turns out it's it was, a, it was a Daniel Weller tasting. So somebody... I didn't say it's a business. I didn't say the person, but somebody very quietly ended up finding a bottle and uh, decided instead of just having it on the shelf, they wanted to share it with good people. And they just asked everyone to kick in a little bit of money to make up for the cost of the bottle. And we all got some really delicious whiskey. 
So what they did is they put out a tasting. It was uh, weeded Weller. Uh, they did the Buffalo Trace kosher wheat. They did the they did an OWA store pick, and then they did a different uh, foolproof store pick, and then they had the Daniel Weller. Uh, so Daniel Weller is the bottle with the compass on on the, the cap. It's something that was released. It's very small uh, release. It's hard to find. I think it's re- retails for five hundred. I think it's going on secondary for like over three grand. Ninety four proof. It's an Emmer wheat recipe, which a lot of people uh, have never had a whiskey that had Emmer wheat in it. It's aged for almost twelve years, and uh, you know, so we did this tasting, and it had a great nose, but it just hit my palate weird. And everyone's kind of like not saying much because no one wants to ruin it or anybody's experience. But uh, after a little while, you know, it, we all kind of decided it wasn't it wasn't bad. It just was probably the least tasty pour on the table. And this is a lot because, I mean, Buffalo Trace kosher weed is good, but should it be good compared to a $500 rare bottle? No. Um, so... I mean, it's my bottle of the week because I was afforded the opportunity to taste it. I really enjoyed the experience, had a great time with, with the guys that I was with. And uh, I wouldn't want to give that that opportunity up ever for, you know, good people, good whiskey, uh, good night, right? So, um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and like I said, I appreciate the ability to taste it. Uh, unfortunately, guys, I can't give away any details on where or how it happened, but... Uh, if I ever meet you privately in person, uh, I, I got pictures of the bottle to prove that it happened. So uh, anyways, that's my bottle of the week. Uh, Daniel Weller, not because it was the most amazing whiskey ever, but because of the experience that it, that it afforded me. So for now, that is all for this week's Whiskey Wire. Remember, open those special bottles and share them with good company. And if you have to drink, please do so responsibly. Cheers.